Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, where we discuss digital transformation and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here, some of the most innovative thinkers and leaders in healthcare and technology talk about how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to have as my special guest today, Graham Gardner, CEO and founder of Kairos. Graham, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the show. My pleasure, Patty. Thanks for having me. So let's get started, Graham. Would you like to tell us briefly about your company, its evolution, and uh, what is the marketplace need that Kairos is trying to address? So uh, Kairos is a routing and scheduling platform for health systems that helps to ensure that patients within their network are getting to the right in-network uh, provider. And uh, the founding vision, Patty, for the company was actually originally Moneyball, and this idea that one can use statistics to understand relative competencies amongst players and use that information to put them up to bat in situations where they're more likely to do well, and the team therefore benefits by everybody uh, playing to their strengths. And I was convinced that, you know, we as physicians, the same way a ball player is trying to hit every pitch, we as physicians were, were trying to help every patient. And yet, statistically, we had huge variations in the care and cost and quality that we were uh, delivering to patients and began to wonder whether we could get a more granular view of providers, their statistics, if you will, and, and use that to understand uh, what they might be best suited to treat and put them up to bat, if you will, or match them uh, with the right kinds of, of patients. And as we began to engage with more and more health care systems around that that conversation, what we uncovered was that many of them were really struggling with the ability to match supply and demand at scale. And and what a lot of them would acknowledge to us was, you know, we know patients are waiting far too long to get in and and access care here. As a result, they're either not getting that care or they're leaking out of the network and, and, and seeking care elsewhere. What was staggering to me, though, Patty, was when they would next say, you know, it's not because we're 100% full. In fact, 20, 30, in some cases, 40% of the appointments were actually empty every single day. And the reason for that was that too often patients were queuing up for Dr. Famous, you know, that many of the other physicians had trained with or someone that the call centers had on a short list to send to. But meanwhile, there might be a brand new doctor uh, who did exactly the same thing as Dr. Famous, and she was sitting at 30% productivity. So as you kind of looked across this large network, You had a lot of demand not being accommodated, a lot of supply going underutilized, and it was only getting worse because health systems were getting larger and larger, and so no one really kind of knew each other anymore at a time when medicine was getting super, super subspecialized. And so gone were these days of, you know, my go-to ortho guy that I I send, you know, all my orthopedic cases to. There was now a hand person, an elbow person, you know, foot and ankle, spine, et cetera, et cetera. And people really didn't have the right information to understand where to refer a particular case that was right for the patient, right for the provider, and allow them to practice the top of their system, and also right for the for the healthcare system. And so, Patty, we, we looked, I often do it in healthcare, you don't have to invent anything new, you have to look at whatever else was doing in the 1980s and just bring it forward. And so we actually looked at the airline industry, which had actually wrestled with and in many ways solved a lot of the same seats, you know, utilization uh, challenges turned out, if you rewind back to 1990, every time an airplane took off in this country, about four out of 10 seats were empty. So, you know, very similar to where some of these health systems found themselves today. And what had transformed that industry were things like the Sabre system that ultimately became the likes of Travelocity and, and Kayak. Basically, this idea that on one screen, you could look across all the providers. You could look across American Airlines or Continental or JetBlue. Uh, in our case, doctors that might be on the Epic scheduling system, the Cerner or Athena, you could sort and filter by business logic. So if I wanted to take off after 9.30 and sort by price, I could you know, click and, and do that quickly. In our case, if I felt more comfortable with a female provider that spoke a certain language, I could, uh, again, click and find who is soonest available and basically book in and, and get that seat, if you will, on a single platform. And so that really became the, the model for how we thought we could help health systems achieve operational financial objectives, but most importantly, get the right clinical care to each of its patients. So today we work uh, with about 600 hospitals around the country, about 250,000 providers on the platform, and um, you know, continue to, to uh, enjoy partnering with, with health systems and increasingly partnering with other companies as well that um, really tie into that overall uh, patient access solution. Fascinating. How long have you been around? We've been uh, around for about nine years. Nine years. So I really like the money ball analogy that you made, and that, that of course, is very catchy and intriguing at the same time. 
And of course, you're addressing a problem that is all too well known, which is patient access, which comes in many shapes and forms in terms of its impact on a particular health system. The utilization rates is obviously one which is very, very visible because it has re- immediate revenue implications for health systems. Mm-hmm. And I'm very, very familiar with this problem. So let me ask you this. So when you start working with health systems, how are they addressing this problem today? And uh, can you give us an example of how you used, let's say, a proprietary algorithm that you've developed to help them get better at what they do? Can you maybe illustrate a simple example? Yeah. Yeah, so it's very much an industry in in transition. I think when we first started, to be perfectly frank, organizations were working off paper. And, you know, I would go into call centers and you would see a, an agent desk, you know, cluttered with different kinds of paper. There, there might be a, a binder that had, you know, profiles and a directory that had been printed out, you know, a year ago and was, you know, likely out of date the, the minute it was printed. There might be special, you know, instructions scribbled down of someone's back office number there. There's a post-it note, you know, that Dr. Jones doesn't take, you know, patients on Yankee game days. And, and you know, the, the poor scheduler who is very much the front line and, and the first voice into a healthcare system you know, it's having to look at all these different disparate data sets to try to route someone uh, to the care. And I think that really was so much of what accounted for, for the inefficiency and in, in being able to kind of make that match. The second thing I, you still see today, Patty, is that different parts of the organization were working with different solutions. And so, you know, there might be a still a print directory going out to all the referring providers, and that was, you know, where people were getting their information there. But the marketing team that was running, you know, the website might be compiling a different set of, of information, and they might be, you know, doing outbound phone calls to the practice to try to keep the address current, or they might be sending out surveys to the doctors to try to do that. Then the call center might have a completely different set of information that might get from credentialing. And too often with that different information, the poor patient was seeing real inconsistencies across that. They might get a name from their referring provider. They go online to do some research and actually they're listed as a different specialty or something like that. Then they call into a call center to book the appointment and find out the person's not even working there anymore. So again, there's a real lack of standards and, and, and the right tools to do that. I think people began to look in different places for solutions. Many of them turned logically, they do, to their, their EMRs, see what they could uh, learn there. But, you know, EMRs are really not built to do that kind of, you know, keyword searching and, and, and routing and certainly not across different EMRs as well. And I think it was for that reason, uh, Patty, that a lot of them began to look to us to see, you know, what we could put across these different EMRs as a, a platform to kind of enable that, that routing. So I want to kind of unpack a couple of things you said. As far as the provider matching is concerned, there's two aspects to the problem. One is the quality of the information as it relates to the provider data. And the other part is actually finding intelligent ways to direct the patient traffic in ways that helps the patients get what they need and also helps distribute the workload in a way that overall utilization levels go up. Are you addressing both problems or just one of them? Yeah, great question, Patty. And we are, although I would say I've been surprised in our journey how much of it is still today the basic data management. So, yes, when we first began talking with health systems, our, our hope was that we could use a lot of this data to, you know, uncover who was most efficient or, you know, most effective in, in different areas. And what we heard from a, a lot of health systems early on was, look, we just want to figure out who our doctors are. And if we can simply get knee cases to knee surgeons and hand cases to hand surgeons, you know, that's a huge lift for us. And so a lot of the work that we do today, Patty, is, is really compiling very robust profiles of providers. We do that by tapping into dozens of different systems. We bring around 200 different data elements to bear in a profile. So a data element might be a personal statement. It might be a specialty training location. It might be a back office number, things like that. And so we pull those from different systems. And and a lot of the work that we do is not only integrating the data. So, for example, I might be Graham S. Gardner, MD there, and Dr. Graham Gardner over here. And, you know, at scale, making sure those are the two same identities, one part of what we do. But actually, more important is really the governance around that data. So, for example, as I was alluding to earlier, a location might be pulled in from a credentialing file, but that only gets updated every two years when someone recredentials. It might be in that marketing database where they've made, you know, outbound phone calls every six months to verify where someone is. But it's also in the Athena practice management system where the provider is seeing patients tomorrow morning. Well, that's probably the most accurate one. And so we do a lot of that work early on in engaging with the health system to understand where to pull the information and then set up all those feeds to make sure it's current and governed and sign off uh, around this. That's the first part. 
But then where we, we next go, Patty, is, is enriching that data with a clinical library of, of terms, conditions, procedures, diseases, and things like that. So we, over the years, beginning with a claims data analysis, but then really curated with a lot of clinical experts and, and now our clients as well, uh, has been to develop a 25,000 term library of conditions and, and procedures that we crosswalk to the different sub sub specialties. So when we onboard an organization and then identify you know, eight peripheral interventional cardiologists, they get assigned anywhere from 100 or 250 terms that describe the typical practice of a peripheral interventionalist. Oftentimes, that provider or their practice manager is actually engaged in that process and actually further curates it and, and can actually do at the condition level, tell us what they want to see in their practice. And that, Patty, is a, is, a, is a huge physician engagement piece to what we do, because I think for providers who are working really hard and, you know, suffering a lot of burnout, the idea of, of you know, a robot coming in and, and filling up their panel and getting it wrong is, is, is understandably a really scary thing for them. And so being able to kind of extend them a tool that says, look, we actually want to understand exactly the kind of patients you want to see. And, and we're not going to be responsible for sending you a knee case if you're actually a hip surgeon. So that, that it really kind of invites them to be a part of that process and is, is the first step of beginning to kind of ensure that quality is, is being accounted for as well. So you're getting people to the right, you know, people for that care. Yeah. We've taken additional data as well. So, for example, uh, Prescani scores and things like that. So you can begin, first of all, to publish that to uh, patients, but also potentially you know, rank how you want to distribute care based on those scores as well. So we're beginning to take more and more steps into quality metrics and things like that so we can ensure that the data is right, but also that the, the organization begins to operationalize its strategy for how it wants to distribute patients within the, the network. Right, right. So who is your, uh, your buyer for a solution like this? Is the chief marketing officer? Patient experience officer, who is your first port of call for something like this? Yes, and yes, Patty. And, and uh, you know, this has really been one of the challenges, and, uh, but I think something that we've embraced and, and do much more effectively today. So, you know, the reality is, as I you know, described, that, that kind of multi-channel approach to scheduling and, and, and patient access, that there are a lot of leaders in the organization thinking about this and, and looking for uh, solutions. And so yeah. we've gotten very comfortable talking with a number of different stakeholders and quite frankly, it can vary by organization, Patty. So, you know, in, in one example, it might be the organizations decided to centralize their call center. They've brought 200 agents all into the same room and it's really the, you know, head of access or the COO that's now yeah. looking for a technology platform to help enable those agents to be as effective as possible. Another organization might be a chief marketing officer who is, you know, competing with an organization down the street that's, you know, now enabling online booking, and she now wants to to enable that for her organization, and and so it starts off, you know, much more as a digital front door type of conversation. Um, in others, it's it's around uh, trying to stitch together a clinically integrated network, and it's you know the clinical leadership uh, that's beginning to look at that. So we oftentimes will start a conversation in, in various parts of an organization. What we do as part of that conversation is to try to bring those leaders together. And even though we do sell our package in, in modular ways, we have a call center package, a website package, and then a more of a distributed point of care package, uh, organizations can buy one or more of those. But we do like to engage all of those leaders in the conversation right up front to help them understand the, the power of standardizing on one platform across all of that. So all of those leaders typically are engaged. Uh, obviously, the CIO and, and the T infrastructure uh, has to be engaged or tapping into many of their different systems. And ultimately, the CFO is often the one writing the, the check and, and really seeing and appreciating the benefits of taking an organization that may only be at 60% utilization of its schedule and driving that to 70%. And, you know, a multi-billion dollar organization has a profound financial impact. Yeah, well, I've been in healthcare tech a long time, and one thing that uh, we all know about uh, the provider ecosystem is that the sales cycles are very long. And Indeed. I'm just thinking from what you just said that, uh, you know, adding a layer of multiple stakeholders that you need to convince, does that make it longer? Does it make it more challenging and difficult for someone like you? It certainly makes it longer, uh, without question. And yet, Patty, I think what we feel is that it positions the company very well because, you know, no other company has really taken the same approach to incredibly robust data management and then, you know, that um, multi-channel approach to matching across all the different access points for an organization. And so it really kind of positions us as well as the, the single vendor that can really provide that solution for folks. You may have answered this question already, but in terms of ROI, right, do you demonstrate it in a very straightforward way by just showing higher utilization rates? Or how do your stakeholders make the business case to invest in a platform like this? 
Yeah, that's been a, a very important part, I think, of our conversation with clients. I'm, I'm a cardiologist by training, Patty, and so I, I grew up in the world of, of clinical studies. And, and, you know, from day one, we instrumented the tool to really begin to understand the impact of, of what we were doing. We think about it in uh, different areas. So one is really around patient acquisition. And this is, I think, easiest to demonstrate on the digital channel. You know, when you take an organization live and, and now enable patients to book online, we see tens of thousands of patients within a month start to book online. And what's incredibly exciting for these organizations is that oftentimes half of those patients are brand new to the system. So they were, you know, they were shopping and consumers are starting to vote with their feet. And if someone allows them to book online, they will you know, select that at eight o'clock at night and book in. So that was very exciting for them. Uh, 80% of those uh, patients are commercial, by the way. So as you, you know, unfortunately have to think about the business side of medicine, that's obviously exciting for clients. But the other aspect of it, which I had not picked up on early on, but talking with our clients about how much they appreciated this, you know, that's 10,000 phone calls, Patty, not going to a call center. And so, you know, from an operational burden perspective, you're actually, you know, acquiring those patients without staffing up call center and things like that. So that's, that's been exciting for people on the, the kind of the acquisition side of things. What we see on on the retention is a 50% reduction in leakage, 5-0. And this was always something that I believe we'd be able to demonstrate when I first started learning about this industry and hearing terms of leakage or patient out-migration. You know, I, I was convinced, Patty, that patients aren't referred out of the system because doctors are bad people trying to sabotage the system. They, they honestly just don't know who their own colleagues are. And, you know, if their go-to person is now Dr. Famous and can't see people for months, that patient needs care. And so oftentimes, yes, you know, it will leak out of the network. And what we found is that if you do provide a tool now for people to find their colleagues and they will do the right thing and, and refer in network and, and really keep that care coordinated, you know, with the same EMR systems and, and all the rest of it. And so that, that's, that's been exciting to see. And the last metric I'll talk to, which is really kind of the home run metric is, you know, do we in fact fill the schedules? And so what's exciting is we will take a baseline of the schedule a year before we go and then measure that again a year later. So you can you know, do comparison of flu season to flu season. And sure enough, we increase schedule densities anywhere from 2 to about 11%, which doesn't sound huge. But, but again, Patty, when you're talking about a multi-billion dollar organization, you know, if you're bringing in you know, 10% more patients to the top of the funnel, it, it generates tremendous amount of downstream radiology and labs and procedures and things like that. So it's been very exciting to, to, to be able to demonstrate that with customers. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice segue to my other question that I was going to come to. You mentioned these are multi-billion dollar organizations. Now we talk about digital front doors, and clearly that's making a huge difference in terms of access. But is there a certain profile of systems to whom this kind of a solution is more applicable and more beneficial than others? For instance, I don't know that a community hospital, inner city environment, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just asking, is this more applicable to them versus maybe a big city hospital in Boston, you know, where you are. Is there a sweet spot? Is there a kind of a kind of an ideal sort of a health system that can get the most out of your solution? Yeah. So, you know, nine years ago, Patty, my instincts were exactly where, where yours were, which was, you know, that the larger and the more academic an organization, the more it could utilize us. Because, you know, there, there really is a, a left nostril surgeon who doesn't like to do right nostril surgery and and, um, you know, being able to kind of really find that, that needle in the haystack it was going to be somewhere where we could shine and allow people to really filter down by a number of different things. And it's also where, you know, again, a lot of the complexity in multiple different systems where the benefit of a platform sitting on top of that and standardizing everything was going to be really beneficial. And so for the first several years, that, that really has been what we targeted, basically the top 400 health systems uh, or so in the country. Oftentimes, they're in very competitive metropolitan areas. And so, you know, again, they, they really are looking for, for something that can differentiate uh, them. What I would say, though, so over the years, we've begun to go down to smaller and, and smaller organizations. And I think particularly around the digital front door, Patty, I think, you know, in the call center, look, if there really only are two orthopedic surgeons, everyone kind of knows who does what in a small hospital that, that may be less compelling. But everybody, even the small hospitals right now, really do want to enable a modern consumer web experience. And to the extent that that involves rich data and videos and the ability to book directly online, that is something we provide. And, and you know, as we've developed our own solution and now scaled it and operationalized it in a way that we can, you know, onboard an organization that size more effectively, we've been able to, to keep going in that direction. So we, we haven't found anyone too small for us yet, Patty. We, we certainly don't do small physician groups, so we don't do you know, the 18-person orthopedic group or anything like that, but we do a wide range now of, of healthcare systems. That's interesting. So let's take a step back and look at the broader picture here. Now, you're part of the digital health ecosystem. 
uh, billions and billions in venture capital money uh, that's uh, pouring into innovative startups. Some of them have done very well. Others are struggling. Based on your own experience, can you talk to what are the biggest, some of the biggest challenges that you have had to overcome? Now, you've been around nine years, so that's long enough for me, I, you know, for me to make <laughs> legitimate, right? <laughs> so yeah. talk to us about a couple of or two or three of your top challenges that you've had in your journey so far. Yeah, to be honest with you, Patty, surviving is one of the key things. These organizations move very slowly, particularly when you're trying to introduce you know, a new market concept or segment that we were very lucky early on to find wonderful champions that could take us into organizations. But there, there really is a lot of alignment that has to happen. And we watched our own space you know, mature over the years from something that one or two people saw. You know, the likes of, of Aaron Martin, who is this such a forward-looking thought leader uh, in this space, to this really becoming a CEO level initiative that now, you know, the C-suite was responding to and, and had budget to go out and, and fund. And so, you know, I think part of it is surviving and, and raised a venture capital support, which has been you know, terrific to allow us just to kind of live long enough, quite frankly, for when the, the market wakes up. So I think that's one part of it. I think the second part is, is really having a humble approach to the industry. I think that Maybe less so today, but certainly when we were starting, there was a lot of you know feeling that gee, help get people behind. You know, they're thirty years behind everybody. They they don't know how to do things. We we can come in and just solve things from a tech perspective in a much more efficient way. And and the reality is that healthcare is different. The, the, even though I will use the analogy of, of airline seats for for what we do, it, it, finding the right provider is more difficult than than booking a you know a seat uh, to Chicago on on American Airlines flights. And so I think coming in with that that humility and, and really listening and. Understanding Understanding that these are people who who care deeply about patients and, and not making mistakes, and people that sell too hard are snake oil salesmen. And I think this industry is trained to repel that. So it really, you have to bring credibility and listening skills. I think in order to kind of understand the, the challenges. And then I think the third thing, and this is you know something that we figured out over time, Patty, is is how to be the right size. And what I mean by that is that. Uh, so much of what I see, you know, even getting funded today, are, are point solutions and, and end up in, in the pilot world. And if you don't have broad organizational buy-in, it's very, very hard to scale something like that. And, and it's, it's so easy for these organizations to spend ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on something, but really not get buy-in. And so there's a certain surface area that I think you need to be able to speak to in order to, to be noticed, quite frankly. And, and you know what we've noticed, Patty, over the years is as our deal size of gotten larger, it commands more attention from the organization. And those end up being much more successful implementations and customers because there really is that, that buy-in across the organization. So I think that's being big enough is one thing. But then I think on the other extreme, Patty, it's in not trying to boil the ocean and do everything. And so a lot of where I've been spending my time over the last year or so has been in forging a number of business development partnerships with other vendors and, and technologies that serve the healthcare system. So, you know, as an example, we've announced a deal with Salesforce and, you know, have an embedded turnkey solution now within their CRM because the reality is the health systems are looking at both scheduling but also CRM. And, and so we're doing more and more of these kinds of partnerships with things in telemedicine and chat technologies and, and things like that so that we play well with others and, and could be part of a, a Lego set, if you will, that, that all kind of works uh, well together. Yeah. So you compete in some areas, you partner in others. Is that kind of the mantra? That's right. And, and you know, a lot of the, the business development deals are just understanding the boundaries. So, hey, I'm going to go up to here. You're going to do it from there. And, and how do we work together and, and, and serve the, the customer the best? Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, uh, you know, the pilot project. Actually, some of the things you mentioned are a little bit counterintuitive, if I may say so, because you would think that the small deals have a, have an easier a chance of entry because, you know, it's not a big financial commitment and it's easier for people to make that kind of a commitment, at least from a buyer standpoint. But what is counterintuitive also is that larger deals get more attention and also are more likely to get organizational buy-in and support to ensure the success of the program. That's kind of a little bit counterintuitive, but very, very insightful as well. Let's talk about the pilot thing, you know, death by pilot, pilot ideas, you know, that's kind <laughs> of, you know, whatever flavor of that, that seems to be the bane of the startup ecosystem in healthcare, in addition to long sales cycles and all of that stuff. What is your recommendation to health systems to break through this? And there is a mutual, as a, Win-win here if both parties can get together and roll out a solution like yours where there is an obvious ROI. 
but you know it doesn't seem to be happening fast enough. So what is your recommendation or what is your wish list, if you will, for health systems to be doing in order to accelerate the adoption of innovation? Yeah, no, it's a great question. One I think a lot about, Patty, I think on the health system side, what I enjoy the most is where an organization really has identified its priorities. And I understand, I, I'm sure you go to HIMSS every year, and I remember standing in that football field of vendors one year and realizing, my gosh, this is what the inbox looks like you know, for someone at these health systems. It's, I'm population health. I'm population health. Pay attention to me. And, and so I, I can understand that it's overwhelming, the inbound demand that, that comes in. And so I think where organizations have clearly articulated, these are the four or five initiatives. You know, this is how we're thinking ourselves proactively about stitching something together. Those tend to be organizations that have really done the work and understand what they're looking for and, and, and make, you know, faster and better decisions. So I think that's that's one of the things that's really taking a proactive view as opposed to kind of a, a reactive one. But then I think, you know, when there is a priority, go in on it. And, you know, there's obviously a time, and we, we did a handful of pilots very early on, Patty, when you're just trying to figure out layout and design and, and understand this. But the quicker that you can move to saying, no, look, this is something that, that matters to us and we're going to invest in it. And we're going to invest in time. We're going to invest in money. And, you know, in a couple of examples for us, Patty, they've actually invested money uh, as well in terms of equity. And so yeah. both, you know, a couple of our health systems are actually investors in, in Kairos as well. And, you know, that has been a really wonderful partnership. Not that we're ever going to return a meaningful investment to a $10 billion healthcare organization, but for the individuals that are there and putting sweat equity and introducing us and caring and, and, and trying to, to make us successful, you know, feeling that they've got a, a skin in the game and, and, and are part of our success, I think has, has meant a lot to them as well. So I think, I think it is, I think it's that investment where there's time and money of picking something and saying, look, this is something we're going to really work hard to try to make successful because it can't just be on the vendor. We need too much from the organization to be successful. And, and so I think it's being committed to that. Fantastic. Well, Graham, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, thank you for setting aside the time to talk to me. I'm sure uh, my listeners are going to have a lot to chew on from from all of your comments. And uh, all the very best to Kairos, all the very best to you and your team, and all success to you. Thank you again. No, thank you, Patty. Really, really enjoyed the conversation, and uh, look forward to talking more. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com and write to us at info at thebigunlock.com.